We uh, have been spending the last several weeks looking into the Gospels at some of the amazing life-altering miracles of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the different miracles Jesus performed while here on earth establishing the foundational truth that he was and still is the Son of God. Amen? And so keeping in mind that none of these miracles in Scripture, as I've pointed out before, um, were performed randomly. They weren't uh, for amusement. They definitely weren't for show. Uh, instead, they served a specific purpose. Um, for example, the turning the water into wine at the wedding of the first miracle that we covered, there was a need presented to Jesus. Remember, Mary, his mother, came to him and said, they've run out of wine and proceeded to tell his servants, the disciples, to do whatever Jesus told them to do, right? And so this miracle showed Jesus' supernatural control over physical water, an element, right, on this earth, which revealed his glory as the Son of God and marked the beginning of his public ministry. Many commentators and different ones believe that that was his first public demonstration of uh, a miraculous power, uh, that uh, he had been given. And so the miracles Jesus performed were personal and purposeful. If there's anything out of this series I want you to get, in, in addition to obviously him being established as the Son of God, is that his miracles, they were personal and they were purposeful. And I think when we think that about modern day, that when we filter our heart towards God and towards others as we pray for them and as we're ministering and listening and talking to people about the Lord, that if we really take it through those veins of it being personal and purposeful, we will weed out a lot of unnecessary stuff, right? And even whenever it comes to assessing and weighing out, you know, whether their miracle is of God or not, one can assess and say, okay, well, is this personal? Is it purposeful? Is it, is it glorifying God in the process, right? So we have covered these miracles uh, that Jesus performed. Each one of them had a message and either met a serious human need or confirmed Christ's identity and authority as the Son of God. We have covered miracles that pointed to his authority. We've gone through a number of weeks talking about different ones that pointed to his authority. Uh, last week, we covered miracles that really showed his compassion, right, with the uh, uh, healing of Jairus' daughter and then also the woman, the woman with the issue of blood and just showed Jesus' compassion uh, to those individuals at that moment. Uh, so continuing today, we are going to look at two different passages of Scripture where Jesus used in that time a common day industry and activity of fishing to help solidify his role in the life of the disciples. Now, how many people in here like to go fishing? We need to do a fishing trip. We've got some fishers in the, in the house. Now, how many of y'all prefer fishing off the bank or prefer going on the boat? Which one? Both? Okay, who, who has a preference? Yes, Bobby. Boat. Bobby's a boat guy. He likes to go out on the boat. I remember uh, Pastor Kim, the pastor we served under in Waxahachie, he was not only a pastor, but he was also a fishing guide. And he would take people out on his boat, and they would catch these big striper bass. And uh, it was always amazing to see some of the stories and the things that he was able to do. Now, of course, he, he not only had God on his side, obviously, but he also had some technology, you know, the little, the little um, radar that was able to indicate, you know, whenever there's schools of fish at a certain depth, right, and that kind of thing. He's also the first one that, that I went out fishing with that showed me how to cast a net to capture minnows, right? That's another form of uh, fishing, and, and, of course, that's for the bait in great measure. But... Uh, Fishing off of a boat is different than fishing off of a pier or off the land. Um, what about bait? Who prefers live bait versus lures? Right? Okay, live bait. Who's a lure person? Lures. Okay, so it's different, right? 
I, I'm a good old fashioned worm guy myself. Just give, just let me throw a worm out there and see what see what bites. Um, so there's different types of fishing. There's, uh, you know, fishing in our time. Of course, we're we're hill country. We're not on the coast. But for those of uh, you that maybe have grown up in the past or or have lived at some point in time in your life on the coast, fishing is not just a a hobby. Uh, it is in great measure even a industry that you are participating in, right? It's part of the life uh, style of the community um, that, that live on the coast and, and do deep sea fishing. And, and uh, how many of y'all like seafood? Who, who, who are seafood lovers? Not so, some, yes, some not so much. All right, we got a diverse group of people in the house. But this fishing industry, it was it was – Similar in Jesus' time, and we know the story, right, of whenever he sets out and he actually um, starts ministry out and brings about the disciples uh, into his ministry fold. And so if you want to go ahead and turn Luke chapter 5, we're going to look at this story. And uh, that was part of uh, some of the disciples' Career that was their their livelihood was fishing, and so we're going to read about that here in Luke chapter five and Jesus calling his first disciples. It says one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. As I as I read this, I want y'all to to picture this in your in your mind, right? Again, play it out. Um, there's always crowds around Jesus. But what was amazing, yes, some came uh, because he was performing miracles, but so many of them came because he was speaking the word of God. An emphasis there I want you to pick up on. In verse 2 of chapter 5 of Luke, it says, He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little further from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Okay, so again, just picture this. Luke is making a point as he's writing this to remember and to, to picture that there, was, there were two boats, boat side, and particularly he, Jesus got into the boat of Simon Peter, and he began he sat down and he began teaching from the boat. Now, some of the commentaries, and as you study this out, the, it, that kind of setting actually created an amphitheater to where his voice would be able to hit the water and actually carry out and communicate more clearly to the crowds that were gathering. And so this was a common way in which Jesus would create some separation from himself, from the crowd, but then also be able to communicate God's word clearly uh, to the people so that they could hear. Now, in verse 4, it says, When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, I would venture to say that Simon Peter was probably within the earshot of whatever Jesus had been teaching the people, right? So he's present. And Jesus makes it a point to tell Simon Peter, after he's done teaching the people, hey, go out into the deep and throw your nets in the water for a catch. Now, Peter, being a professional fisherman, knew a little something about fishing, right? Again, that was his livelihood. livelihood. That's what he and his family depended upon. And it says here that his response in verse 5, he says, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. I'm going to stop there for a second. Because we find ourselves in that same place sometimes, don't we? Where in our own strength, we are striving. We are working to produce. We are doing all that we know to do. And here Peter is at the end of a long evening, right, after having been fishing all night long, and he's washing their nets. He's, they're actually kind of wrapping things up, only to hear Jesus say, why don't you go out to the deep, throw your net back in the water for a catch? Now, there's 
couple of responses that can happen even in our own hearts whenever we feel an unction from the Lord or there's a direction that's given of whether we're going to comply and obey or whether we're going to buck up and we're going to self-explore and say, well, I know better. Uh, this is my work. This is my career. I understand things, right? But what does Peter say, his response the latter part of verse 5, it says, But because you say so, I will let down the nets. That is huge. Don't miss that. Because you say so. There is evidently already something working in the heart of Peter towards respecting Jesus in his authority as the master, as the teacher, to where he said, You know what? We've, and it, it, seems lot, it, it seems illogical because we've already been doing this all night long. It doesn't make sense. But because you say so, I will let the nets down. Verse 6, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat. Remember, there were two boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Can you imagine Jesus <laughs> watching this play out? You know, he said, why don't you go out into the deep, put your nets back down in the water for a catch. And they actually do it. And then next thing you know, they're calling for help because the haul is just so much. How many of y'all have ever been out fishing and you hit a bumper day? Like, I mean, it was miraculous in a sense how many fish you were catching. Anybody? Yes, a couple? I've never had one of those days. <laughs> I would love to have one of those days, but I know it happens. You can get in the thick of it sometimes to where as soon as your, your line hits the water, next thing you know, you're pulling it out. And, and, I mean, those are really good days, right? So can you imagine what Peter in his heart was feeling at that moment? Of course, it says that there was so much that the boats began to sink, Wait a minute, that's my livelihood. I'm, I'm about to lose the very vessel that I depend upon to feed my family, and, and, and here it is sinking. I need help. So they bring in the help, and they're bringing the, uh, the fish in. It says in verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet or knee, knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Wait a minute. This just got spiritual. It went something from very physical to something very internal and personal and spiritual to Peter. Something shifted in his understanding of who Jesus was in that moment and the power that Jesus has. He says, go away from me. Lord, I am a sinful man, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Wait a minute. Here they are. They're out doing what, what they do day in and day out. You have good days. You have bad days. How many of y'all go fishing for uh, the experience in terms of just the beauty of the sunset or the sunrise, you know, the atmosphere, quiet time with God? I have to say that's kind of where I land most of the time, right? It's not always about what you pull out of the water. But in this situation where this was... They're normal every day, day in and day out, and their encounter with Jesus, this was going to be one for the books, literally, the book, right? And they pull in so much, and it grips Peter at the core, even to the point to where he is repentant of his sins. That's how astounded he was at what Jesus had done and told them to do and the outcome 
that miracle that happened in his life. Now, the other huge miracle is simply this, and y'all probably caught it at the end. It says in verse 11, so they pulled their boats up on the shore and they left everything and followed him. Left everything and followed him. All their investment, all their time, all their skill, everything. They were such a, a transformation that was happening in their hearts because of what took place that they said, we're going to follow this man. And they began to follow Jesus. And Jesus, the big takeaway there, obviously, is instead of fishing for fish, he told them that they would begin fishing for men. Right? So, Jesus used something familiar to help Simon Peter understand a principle of the kingdom. No longer would he be focused on fishing for fish, even though that was what he understood, he knew, but he would be fishing for people in God's kingdom. The application for us is when God calls us, believers, followers of Jesus Christ, to follow him, he meets us where we are at. So many times, Jesus meets us right where we are. You know, Peter wasn't all cleaned up and looking good and, and going into the synagogue and, and anticipating singing praises to the Lord. No, he was out working. He was even cleaning the messy nets. And Jesus met him right where he was at. And he spoke something familiar to Peter's heart. Something personal and familiar. God does the same for us. Realize that when God uses you to minister to others, he will do the same. Be intentional. Look for similarities, for common ground, personal parallels that God can use to open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. God is a creative God. We have uh, tracks and all these different means of evangelism, and I just want to remind you that the best way to share the gospel message with friends and family and coworkers is on a personal level. Having ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying and then speaking directly to whatever need they might be presenting, whatever common ground you might have with them, take it to something familiar and then ask the Lord to reveal to you. Maybe it's a word of wisdom. Maybe it's a word of knowledge. Do we trust Holy Spirit to speak to us that way today? We should because we are active. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We sang about it earlier about more love, more power, more of you in my life. I don't know about you, but I feel really guilty sometimes asking for more whenever I'm not using all that I've already gotten. We have to realize that just like a sponge, when we ask for more, the Lord wants us to wring it out and to use it for his kingdom. Otherwise, we're just going to be nasty sponges sitting on the counter. I don't know about you, but those things can get nasty if you don't wring them out or use them. God, when we say, Lord, we want more of you, not just to be takers, but that we would be givers of the gospel. Right? Amen? So God many times will show us familiar things, creative ways to link people into the relationship with him because he knows us and he knows their hearts. You see Jesus with the woman at the well, all kinds of different scenarios where he, he got personal. And some people think that's taboo and, and you have to be careful. Well, you do have to be careful. You do have to have a sensitivity. But understand that whenever you step out in obedience and you've had that quality time with God, that he will equip you with the right words to say, with the right prayers to pray. Amen. So before we get into uh, the next story, um, because even though Peter uh, proceeded you know, to fish for people, as Jesus was directing him to do, there was still another occasion where Jesus sent him out to go fishing, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. But before we do that, I want to transition to a modern-day uh, fishing story, and this did go viral 
And so maybe y'all saw this, but Joel, go ahead and put that uh, picture up. Can y'all look at that real close? You see? Can Can you see what that is? You got you got a you got a fish there with a frog in its mouth. Isn't that crazy? I'm going to tell you the background story on this. It says Australian angler Angus James was about to release the jungle perch when he noticed a live green tree frog in its mouth. He said, I was fishing in one of my favorite rainforest streams in far north Queensland, Australia, when I cast my Z-Man soft plastic lure into a dark shaded area, James told Reptiles Mag's magazine editor Russ Case, who posted the photo on the magazine's Facebook page. It was soon crunched by a nice-sized jungle perch, and as uh, he was pulling out the lure from the fish, prior to releasing it back into the water, he noticed two little eyes looking back at him from inside the fish's mouth. And after capturing the picture, he says that the little green tree frog leaped straight out past his head and onto the nearest tree. <laughs> he said, wow, what a lucky frog, right? <laughs> So, but I thought, man, I don't know how many of y'all, again, going fishing, you've ever opened up that mouth of the bass or whatever it is and, and you have something looking back at you. That'd be pretty trippy. All right, Joel, you can take that off the... But that, the reason why I shared that with you guys, I remembered that photo and whenever I was looking at the miracles and I'm about to read this one out of Matthew chapter 17, I had that image stuck in my mind, Right? And so when we look at Matthew chapter 17, 24, 27, again, um, we have a fishing story, uh, this one of, of some pretty uh, intense proportions. And again, so many times we read through the scripture and we're like, oh, it's just Jesus, so it makes sense. Pause long enough to really get a grasp of what happened, all right? So in verse 24 of Matthew 17, it says, After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He, he asked, From whom? Do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from their own children or from others? Okay, so I'm going to stop there for a second. So you have this scenario, right? You're going, what does this have to do with fishing? We're getting there. We're getting there. So here's Peter. Here's Jesus that are at the house. And the, the leaders come by, and they're asking if Peter's master, who is Jesus, pays the temple tax, to which he responded quickly, yes, he does. But now he has to go and collect, right? He has to go in the house. But before Peter is even able to approach Jesus about the conversation that happened outside, Jesus speaks to Peter and he asks him this question. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? Peter answered, from others. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. So I want to I give a little understanding of that, right? Jesus was who? The Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, right? And he embodied the symbolism of the temple. And yet, here are the spiritual leaders coming and asking Jesus if he's going to pay the tax to the temple. And Jesus then pitches it to Peter and says, who, who pays taxes, the king's children or other children? Well, in real terminology of life, so many times the king's children are exempt, right? So in essence, Jesus was saying, hey, I'm the son of God. I'm exempt from having to pay the temple tax, spiritually speaking. But watch what he says here. Verse 27 but so that we may not cause offense, watch this, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, 
and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. So next time you need to pay your taxes, go fishing. No, <laughs> that's not the moral of the story. No, but, but here it is. I mean, imagine. Here's this conversation, a real life scenario. Jesus being a Jew, his rightful duty as a citizen is to do what? To pay the temple tax. But yet because of who he is, the son of God, he's making a spiritual point, a teaching point to Peter, if you will, to say, hey, we're, I'm exempt in essence, but as to not offend, do this. Go to the lake. Throw your line in the water, and the first fish you catch. I've always, I, I mean, I, when I was reading this, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm happy to pull one fish out of the water after four or five throws, let alone. And he goes, the first fish that you catch, open its mouth, and in there will be this coin to pay the temple tax. You know, I, again, I have that image of the frog in the, in the fish's mouth. Can you imagine? Now, Peter had to step out in faith. And obey. Now, thankfully, he had prior experience with Jesus that when Jesus told him to do something and he did it, he would see the result, right? So we don't have the continuing story, but I believe God's word is true. And then if it's in there, then that's what happened. Peter would have gone and done exactly what God instructed, and he would have been to pay the temple tax because he found the coin in the fish's mouth. So that's just, it just blows my mind when I think about the detail of what Jesus knew in the various situations he encountered and how, again, he met a personal need right there. Remember, Peter had already opened his mouth, which was pretty common for Peter, right? He had already obligated Jesus in a sense by saying, yes, he does. And so now Jesus follows it all the way through and supernaturally, beyond just nature, supernaturally provided the means for them to be able to pay the tax. Now, within that whole story was this aspect of doing this as to not offend. I want to read something that I wrote, or not that I wrote, but that I read um, pertaining to this. It says, in this text, we see that Jesus refrains from exercising his rights as the Son of God to avoid any obstacles to sharing the good news with people. Jesus considered how his action or inaction would affect the spread of the good news of God. So from Jesus, we learn that asserting one's rights is not always best for the sake of the gospel or for the sake of our brothers and sisters in Christ. In Christ, through the example of Jesus, we learn how to exercise our own freedoms by prioritizing the gospel. Because if you think about it the other direction, what could have transpired if Jesus would have, in his right, said, no, I don't, I'm exempt. What a stir, what an uproar that could have potentially created. But he wanted to teach Peter a lesson in the moment. And for us, all these thousands of years later, that even though we might have rights because of position, that it's always best to filter our approach, our action, or our inaction through the gospel message and the possible effect it's going to have on people's hearts. Right? So I like to say it this way. It's not that we walk on eggshells and that we can't be bold and that we can't speak the truth. And we, we do all of it as unto the Lord in obedience to the Lord. It's whenever we venture out on our own strength or our own abilities that we have a tendency to step in it or make a mistake, right? And we have to backtrack, how many of y'all are thankful for God's mercy that he, he helps us whenever we make those kind of mistakes, right? He is perfect. We are not. But we can learn these important lessons. And my heart towards you guys, again, is in your conversations with your family, with your friends, coworkers, whoever it is, even people within the church, that 
we don't always just approach everything from a place of I have a right to. Just because you have a right to doesn't make it the right thing to do, right? There's this element of a sensitivity to what is the Holy Spirit speaking? What is God directing you to say into every situation? So both of these examples of miracles found in the scriptures demonstrated, especially to Peter, right? He's, he's highlighted there for both of them, uh, the power that Jesus had. These were very personal encounters where Jesus used something familiar to Peter to help his belief in Jesus as the Son of God. The big takeaway for Peter was a calling to be a fisher of man. God calls us to a similar task through the Great Commission. Jesus still desires to encounter people in a real personal and purposeful way. He uses you and me to accomplish his work here on earth. Remember that he is with you, that he empowers you. He is still powerful and able to do more than we can ask or think. Amen. He wants to work in and through our lives. So let's prioritize the gospel this week in our daily walk with him. You know, having having that moment in the morning, setting things up right from the get go and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to us things that are going on in our lives and the lives around us. And then in a similar fashion, just constantly acknowledging who Jesus is with our words, with our actions and how we approach the people around us. So why don't we stand and we'll close in prayer. And again, you know, I know we're sending off the kids this week to school in many capacities, but even the way we respond to administration, to schools, to um, all of that, how are we best representing Jesus? How are we potentially leading people into a relationship with him? Um, To say that our society is politically charged and, and uh, that there's challenges and there's division would be an understatement. I think God continually desires for us to go back to his word, to see Jesus as the example. I haven't even gotten into recently anything about turning the other cheek. But how often do we find ourselves in situations where we rise up in our personality, in our frustration with the whatever it is at the moment, and we charge forward, all the while missing the direction that God maybe has for us in that moment. Keep in mind this. When Jesus did these things with Peter, Peter wasn't the only one affected. It influenced the people all around Peter as well. Could you imagine the other disciples and the other people as they watched these boats being filled with fish? And then for these men to literally leave the best fishing day of their life to go and follow Jesus. Think about it. I mean, this is extreme, but what if you encountered God in such a powerful way today And he asked the same of you and said, you know what? I know you've dedicated your life to studying and to doing this and to doing that. But I'm calling you to be a full-time fisher of men. And here's what it looks like. First things first, you have to leave the life that you once lived. All that you thought you understood, you now have to filter through who I am in your life as Lord. See, there was a true counting the cost that in that moment, they were so gripped in their hearts. Even Peter repented of his sins. When's the last time that you felt so gripped by the Holy Spirit and that God called you to a new work or some some new season of life and that you were willing to say, yes, I will follow you. I will follow you, Jesus.
whatever you ask of me, I will do. It looks different for everybody. It's not a cookie cutter approach. It's not saying everybody has to enter into the ministry. I appreciate Howard's uh, conviction about work is worship. But what it does mean is obedience day in, day out, time with God, time in his presence, hearing his voice, and then being obedient to the tasks at hand that he sets for you to do. I'm going to pray over us this morning. And if there's any of y'all that would like to come up for prayer while Nicole's playing, we want you to do that. You can make it an altar place here. Uh, If you need to go, you're welcome to go. I'll say a dismissal prayer as well. And then we'll wrap things up, and then we'll have some fellowship time afterwards. But I really want us to do an internal look and just ask Holy Spirit to search us. Lord, we thank you for your word. Jesus, you are the Son of God. Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, we know that you are able to do above and beyond anything that we ever ask or think. We trust in you. We lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you. And we believe that you do direct our paths. So God, for each one here, as, as we are anticipating the new season of school and for some of us that have kiddos or grandchildren uh, and that might be affected by schedules changing, all of that, Lord, I pray that we would not miss moments where in your still small voice you're speaking to us. Maybe we're supposed to pray for someone. Maybe we're supposed to give a word of encouragement. Maybe we're supposed to have a hard conversation with someone in love. Whatever it might be, we call you Lord for a reason. You aren't a Lord for convenience. You are Lord because there is no other. There is no other that we can follow that brings life. There is no other that we can follow that will bring light to this dark world. Jesus, you and you alone, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. No one comes unto the Father except by you. So Lord, I just pray for each one again today that you would just speak to our hearts as we reflect and we think upon our lives in this current season, that maybe maybe there's something you're speaking to us. Give us ears to hear. Give us the strength and the boldness to carry it out. And we do believe that your kingdom will advance and that you are faithful to fulfill every promise that you make. We love you. Thank you, God. Amen. Let's just for a moment, let's just wait upon the Lord. And again, if you feel you want to come up and have prayer, come on up.